Well, we come now to our catechism lesson, the last Lord's Day. We introduced a new series, which is essentially a introduction to systematic theology. And we began our series starting with the doctrine of Scripture. And under this doctrine, we are going to be looking at the attributes of Scripture, starting with the attribute of necessity last week. If you recall, I raised this question last week. Why are we starting with the doctrine of Scripture instead of starting with the doctrine of God? Many Christians would argue that we have it backwards. After all, it seems to make more sense to talk about God, you know, who or what He is, first, and then once we've settled in our mind that there is a God, we can then bring in the Bible into the picture and tie that in with our concept of God. But as we noted last week, there are multiple problems with such an approach. One, how can we talk meaningfully and rightfully about God unless we first define what God is and is not? How can we rightly define what God is without first establishing where we get that knowledge from? Are we free to define God however we see fit? And if that's the case, then what difference does it make what any of us believe about God? It doesn't matter. But if it does matter, and as a Christian, I hope you would think it matters, and it does matter because God forbids us to have other gods before him, the first commandment, then how do we know our ideas of God are correct unless we have a standard by which to judge our ideas? And so from a logical standpoint, it's impossible and quite frankly loony to have multiple contradictory ideas about God and think that all of these ideas are true. For example, God is either a triune God or he's not. He can't be both at the same time. But logic alone is not going to help you answer the question of whether he's triune or not. We need something more to help us with that question, and that something more that is of, of absolute necessity is God's own self-revelation. And then the second point we raised is we looked at, uh, or the second argument is because God himself tells us uh, the, the state that we're in as natural man and the ignorance and foolishness that we're in. And for that, we looked at briefly 1 Corinthians 1 and 2. Again, just to remind you, remember Paul, just to highlight a few things that Paul said there. He said in chapter 1, verse 21, that the world through wisdom, that is the world's wisdom, did not know God. In chapter 2, verse 11, he wrote, For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. And then verse 14, The natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Beloved, if we are left to ourselves, we are in darkness, blind people leading blind. But not all is lost. But Paul goes on to say in chapter 2, verse 16, For who has known the mind of the Lord, that we may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. And we see in this context the means by which we go from being deaf, dumb, and blind to now knowing, hearing, and seeing. And that is in verse 12, that God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. God, whose mind we cannot possibly read and know, has revealed his mind to us, at least partially. He has communicated to us. He has spoken. But of course, as I mentioned last week, in appealing to such a text, in arguing that this is God's argument himself, for why we start from Scripture, this assumes that this text was given to us by God to begin with. My argument from 1 Corinthians 1 and 2 loses all of its force apart from this next attribute of Scripture, which we're going to consider today, and that is the attribute of inspiration. So what exactly is inspiration? And what is the issue we are seeking to resolve regarding this attribute? Well, here we have to be very, very careful. If you were to look up the word inspiration in an English dictionary, and then applied that definition to the doctrine of Scripture, you're very easily and quickly going to go down the wrong path. If you look at the etymology of the word and some of its earliest usage, the, the word inspiration meant an immediate influence of God 
or of a God, especially that under which the holy books were written. It comes from an old French word meaning inhaling or breathing in, as well as from a late Latin noun of action from the past participle stem of a Latin word which means to blow into or to breathe upon. You have the prefix in with the word spire which means to breathe. Later on, however, the word evolved from that to mean something of the sense of to infuse animation or influence. That is to affect or to arouse, to guide or control. And so we get this modern notion today of I've, I'm inspired. I've, I'm mentally stimulated to do something or to feel something, particularly something creative. People who are involved in the music or arts talk this way. You know, if you were to come up to me after church later and say, Jason, can you sit down and write a rap lyric for me? Chances are I'm not going to be able to do it. I just can't sit down and just start writing. It just doesn't happen for me that easily. But what usually happens is I'll be driving along and I'll hear some nice beat, some instrumental, start bobbing my head. It's like, this is nice. And all of a sudden it just starts flowing. And it just comes to me. I get inspired by the beat. Now, there's nothing wrong in talking this way, but is that what we mean when we talk about inspiration of the Bible? Gordon Clark wrote, In recent theology, the Bible has been called inspired in the sense that Shakespeare's plays may be called inspired. That is, they are inspiring. They excite us, they elevate our ideas, they enlarge our views and give us an understanding of human nature. On this meaning of inspiration, it is usually said that not all parts of the Bible are equally inspired. The genealogies are dull and uninspiring. End quote. But again, is this what we mean by the word? Well, in short, no. And how do we know this? Well, we've already established last week that if we are to know God and know the things of God, we need to start with the scriptures. And so it's natural the first place we need to go to is the Bible. And when we, uh, when we consider what scripture, how it defines inspiration for us, we will come to understand why many modern notions of biblical inspiration are just wrong. Now, some people will point out that in most of our English Bibles, the word inspired is used, uh, particularly 2 Timothy 3.16. And so they may argue that holding to such a view of inspiration is justified. But again, beloved, this is where we have to be careful with English and then projecting modern definitions of a word into the Bible and to give those uh, words meaning that the authors did not intend. So let's look at 2 Timothy 3.16 carefully. Paul writes, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now the phrase here, given by inspiration of God, you find in the New, uh, King James and many other English translations, is the translation of a single Greek word, theopanustos. Uh, now, I don't know if you caught it, but you can hear a word in that word that we mentioned last week, theos, which is translated as God. And so theopanustos is a compound word. It's two Greek words put together to form one word. The first word is theos, which means God. And then the second word is panustos, which means to breathe. And so literally the word means God breathed. The word translated here as scripture is the Greek word graphe, which means writing. And so you'll, if you have a Young's literal, which I like to, to go to every now and then, he translates it as, every writing is God-breathed. Now, this is, sounds a little bit more different and more profound than just simply saying that Scripture is breathed into or that Scripture has the ability to stimulate somebody to creativity, doesn't it? What Paul is saying here is not that men wrote these things and then God, after the fact, assessed it then gives his thumbs up, and then somehow breathes into it some sort of divine approval or something. Nor is Paul saying that these writings are inspirational because they were the product of some just really smart men who were ahead of their times, 
and through their genius are able to elevate our minds to bigger and better things. Rather, what Paul is saying here very clearly is that God breathed out these words. As Gordon Clark notes, we might metaphorically say that the scriptures are God's breath. Warfield writes, the Greek word in this passage, theopanustos, very distinctly does not mean inspired of God. This phrase is rather the rendering of the Latin restored from Wycliffe and Remish versions of the Vulgate. The Greek word does not even mean, as the authorized version translated, given by inspiration of God, although that rendering has at least to say for itself that it is a somewhat clumsy, perhaps, but not misleading paraphrase of a Greek term or of the Greek term in theological language of the day. The Greek term has, however, nothing to say of inspiring or of inspiration. It speaks only of aspiring or inspiration. What it says of Scripture is not that it is breathed into by God or is the product of the divine inbreathing into its human authors, but that it is breathed out by God. God breathed the product of the creative breath of God. In a word, what is declared by this fundamental passage is simply that the scriptures are a divine product without any indication of how God has operated in producing them, end quote. In other words, scripture is divine revelation. It is the authentic voice of God. I think of that picture that floats around on social media sometimes, little kids like, God, would you speak to me? And in the next frame, you see a Bible being handed down from the clouds. Here, want to hear God's voice? Here you go. And this really does get to the heart of the issue here regarding inspiration. See, nobody has a problem understanding that we've got a book in our hands. It came from somewhere. Somebody wrote it. Some men wrote it. We can debate who and when these things were written. There's no denying we have a book in our hands. But what 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us, however is that these writings are more than just merely the writings of men. It tells us that God is the ultimate author of these writings. Furthermore, Raymond writes, when Paul characterizes the scriptures as theopanustic, that is, as being of the character of the very breath of God breathed out, Paul was asserting something about its nature. Just as God's breath created all the host of heaven, Psalm 33, 6. Just as his breath gave physical life to Adam and to all mankind, Genesis 2, 7. Just as his breath gave spiritual life to Israel, the valley of dry bones, Ezekiel 37. So also his powerful creative breath in its word form is living and active, Hebrews 4, 12. Imperishable and abiding, 1 Peter 1, 23. And through it, God's spirit imparts new life to the soul, end quote. Now, I want to comment on the words all writings, but before I do that, let's look at a few more passages real quick that convey this understanding of the nature of inspiration. In Numbers 12, 6 through 8, we read, Then he said, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. I speak with him face to face, even plainly and not in dark sayings, and he sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? In Deuteronomy 18, 14, uh, 14 through 21, it says, For these nations which you will dispossess listened to soothsayers, and diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not appointed such for you. The Lord your God will raise it for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear according to all you desire to the Lord your God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, nor let me see this great fire any more lest I die. And the Lord said to them, What they have spoken is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he will speak to them all that I command him. And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet will die. In Jeremiah 1, 
It says, Then the Lord, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I had ordained you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, oh, Lord God, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day set over you the nations and over the kingdoms to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build and to plant. Well, if we jump ahead to the New Testament, Paul writing to the Galatians, he says, but I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man, for I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul writing to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 2.13 says, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. And then lastly, Peter writes in 1 Peter 1, of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves but to us they were ministering the things which, have, uh, which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. So, beloved, that the Bible testifies of an inspiration in the nature of which God gives to man his word, that is, putting his word in their mouth, is clear and undeniable. But then Raymond goes on to ask this question, but how does God give this word revelation to men? Well, Peter answers this in a generic way in 2 Peter 1, 20 through 21. There he writes, No prophecy of Scripture arose from, one, from one's own interpretation. For prophecy was never brought by the will of man, but by the Holy Spirit being born along, men spoke from God. Notice here in this passage that Peter gives us two negatives and then two positives or affirmations. The two negatives of, of Scripture are these. One, that no prophecy of Scripture originated in man's own understanding. And two, that no prophecy of Scripture was motivated by man's will. That is, uh, no prophecy of Scripture came from mere human impulse. And by these negatives, Peter totally excludes the human element as the ultimate originating cause of Scripture. But then Peter asserts two affirmatives about Scripture in contrast to answer the two negatives. First, Peter declares that the prophets spoke from God. That is, what they spoke did not originate in them, but it was given to them by God. And then secondly, Peter tells us that the means whereby the prophets spoke from God. He says they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Some translations say that. That phrase, as they were moved, comes from a single Greek word, which, me which means to be born along, present passive. That is, they were continually born along by the Holy Spirit as they spoke or wrote. They were under the Spirit's direct superintending influence the entire time that they spoke or wrote as prophets. Clark, speaking of Moses as an example of God's prophet, says that because he's asking the question, well, what does this look like? How did this come about? He says, God who works all things according to his will and who has done whatsoever he pleased, for no one can stay his hand or say, what, has thou, what doest thou? From all eternity decreed to lead the Jews out of slavery by the hand of Moses. To this end, he so controlled events that Moses was born at a given date, placed in the water to save him from an early death, found by Pharaoh's daughter, 
given the best Egyptian education possible, driven into the wilderness to learn patience, and in every detail so prepared by heredity and environment that when the time came, Moses' mentality and literary style were instruments precisely fitted to speak God's words. Between Moses and God, there was an inner union, an identity of purpose, a cooperation of will such that the words Moses wrote were God's own words and Moses' own words at the same time, end quote. So below we see it is not that the Bible becomes the word of God with some momentous event or that the Bible is a witness to the word of God, but rather that the Holy Spirit so superintended the writers of the Bible that the words that they produced are at the same time the exact words of God himself with all the authority his speech carries with it. Beloved, well, that in a nutshell is the biblical doctrine of inspiration. Now, you may not like it, you may not agree with it, but that doesn't matter. This is how God himself defines this doctrine for us, this attribute. And since these writings are the very breath of God, this implies many other things, including their infallibility, their authority, and sufficiency. Inspiration was given to ensure the truthfulness of what we possess. Well, to conclude, let's return back to 2 Timothy for a second, 3.16, and comment on the words, all scripture, every writing. Is Paul saying that everything that has ever been written down in the history of man is God-breathed? As it says, all writing. You know, some people treat the word all that way. But beloved, remember the word all means the sum total of a group of particulars. And what those particulars are is not determined by the word all in and of itself, but by the context used by the author. Paul here does not have every single writing in history in mind, but rather a particular group of writings. So what are those writings? Well, this raises the question of the canon. That is, why do we have the books that we have and not others? Why are these 66 books received and these alone as our rule and as our standard? Well, this is a whole nother message. We don't have time, definitely don't have time for that. But in short, if we survey the Bible, we can see how the 66 books are accounted for and how we come to possess what was intended. The basic answer to this question is that when men wrote these books, they came to be aware that they had written the word of God. And right away, the community of the faithful recognized the voice of God in these writings because the spirit of God caused them to recognize their master's voice. Thus, right away, each new book was added to the collection that Moses had begun. And this process went on during the Old Testament times and continued into the New Testament. We see this process in action in 2 Peter 3.16, where Peter refers to Paul's letters as already part of the canon of Scripture. So how do we know today that some books have not been lost? How do we answer those who claim that the canon of the Bible did not come into existence until around the 4th century A.D.? And to answer these questions, we must look at the early days of church history. During the second century AD, the heretic Marcion produced a list of his approved books of the Bible. Marcion held that the Old Testament God was an evil God of wrath, so he eliminated the Old Testament and those places in the New Testament that fably referred to the God of the Old Testament. And to answer Marcion, the church formulated once and for all the list of the true books of the Bible. But beloved, keep in mind that for the most part, the church simply listed the books that had always been recognized as the word of God. They were already at work in the covenant community. It's not like the church authorized the canon. They're recognizing it. They're recognizing the voice of God that had already been at work in their midst. Questions were raised about a few short New Testament books like Jude and the letters of John, but the church determined that these were truly scripture because they had always been recognized as apostolic and because there was nothing suspicious about their content. A couple of other books, such as the first letter of Clement and the Shepherd of Hermas, were proposed for inclusion, 
But the church did not include them because the authors of these books themselves indicate a clear difference between their authority and the authority of the apostles. And none of the other books in circulation were seriously considered because they were obvious frauds. To conclude, F.F. F. Bruce writes, certainly as, one looks back, look, certainly as one looks back on the process of canonization in early Christian centuries and remembers some of the ideas of which certain church writers of that period were capable, it is easy to conclude that in reaching a conclusion on the limits of the canon, they were directed by a wisdom higher than their own. It may be that those whose minds have been largely formed by Scripture as canonized find it natural to make a judgment of this kind, but it is not mere hindsight to say with William Barclay that, quote, the New Testament books became canonical because no one could stop them from doing so. Or even in the exaggerated language of Oscar Coleman, that, quote, the books were, which were to form the future canon forced themselves on the church by their intrinsic apostolic authority, as they still do, because Christ speaks in them. You remember the scripture, Jesus said, my sheep will hear my voice, and they will not listen to another. Well, much more can be said there. I just opened up a whole can of worms with that one, but I mainly wanted to focus on today because it's so convoluted and confused by so many as to the nature of inspiration. That is, that these words are God-breathed. They are breathed out by God, God putting his words in the mouths of his spokesmen. And anything other than that is simply not biblical inspiration. 